In this lecture in Climate and Earth 401, we are going to continue to talk about scale analysis, and we are going to talk about the scale analysis of the horizontal momentum equations. This scale analysis will lead us to a formal definition of the geostrophic approximation. The purpose of scale analysis is ultimately to simplify the equations. We could view this as a filtering process, or we can view it as a way to isolate the dynamical feature that we want to study. And when I say a dynamical feature, I would mean something like a tornado, perhaps a thunderstorm, a hurricane, or a mid-latitude cyclone. If you go back to our earlier lectures on the description of the atmosphere, you will see that when they were introduced, the spatial scale, the size of the feature, was introduced along with them, and that is because of the importance of scale analysis. Scale analysis is a technique that is not at all limited to dynamical meteorology. In fact, you use it somewhat intuitively, probably in every day of your life, when you're trying to figure out, for example, how long does it take to get someplace so that you can be there on time? You also use it when you're thinking about spending perhaps some discretionary money. What is the scale of this amount of money relative to the obligations that I might have to pay in terms of rent or groceries? Our goal is ultimately to solve some system of equations so that we can explore how the atmosphere works it is also very important and central that we want to be able to predict motion in the state of the atmosphere for applications such as weather forecasting and climate projections. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the x and y components of the momentum equations. You should be able to write these out now. They have been introduced in class, as well as you have had homework problems on these. But here are the equations. There is an acceleration term, a du dt or a dv dt. There are what we would call here the curvature of the metric terms. There are the pressure gradient terms. There are the Coriolis terms. There are frictional terms. The units, each of these terms has the units of acceleration, which is meters per second squared, or it's now worth thinking about them more generally, or perhaps more abstractly, as length per time squared, because we are now going to be talking about length scales and time scales. Hence, it's perhaps a little more natural to think about these in terms of how large or how small something is, how fast or how slow something is. Towards that end, we are going to make up these variables that are representative of the scale associated with the different terms in this equation. For example, this term has a velocity and this term has time. Towards that end, what we're going to have is we're going to pick u as a horizontal velocity scale suitable for both meridional and zonal, or x, y, velocities. We're going to pick w big W as a vertical velocity scale. We'll pick large L as a horizontal length scale. We're going to pick H as a vertical length scale. The pressure gradient is the attribute of pressure that we're interested in. Hence, we're going to look at a scale suitable for a pressure gradient. We're considering always the pressure gradient in terms of its ratio with the density. We will have the density as a parameter that we need to consider. If you go back to the lecture on the time scale, the first lecture in the series of lectures on scale analysis, then you will see that we arrived at L over U as an appropriate time scale for acceleration. These are taken from the text, Holton and Hakeem. They are characteristic numbers of U, the horizontal velocity being 
represented by something like 10 meters per second. You will see this getting up potentially even to 100 meters per second. Typical motions will be on the order of 10 meters per second away from the ground. W is in centimeters per second and you need to take some care to notice those units. Meters per second for horizontal, W is in centimeters per second. L for a large-scale mid-latitude feature, such as a mid-latitude cyclone, L has a value of something like 10 to the 6 meters. H, the depth, the vertical scale, is more like 10 to the 4th. If we were to go back to our figures looking at the atmosphere and convert these to kilometers, you would see that this is something like 10 kilometers, so the depth of the troposphere, this is something like 1,000 kilometers. L over U then gives us a timescale suitable for acceleration of 10 to the fifth seconds. Delta P, a characteristic pressure gradient, we will take to be 10 hectopascals. Rho is 1 kilogram per meter cubed. That gives us this delta P over rho as an estimate for our pressure gradient of 10 to the minus 2. F naught, as revealed in the lecture on the time scale, is about 10 to the minus 4 per second, which is the value of F at 45 degrees, F being 2 omega sine of the latitude. And we will introduce, though not use immediately, this other parameter df dy, which is the meridional or the y gradient of the Coriolis term, which will be called beta, and that quantity is 10 to the minus 11 over meter seconds, or 10 to the minus 11th per meter per second. So the exercise now is to write out the scales for the terms in the horizontal momentum equation. So how would we do this? We would take a term like this, the uw over a, which is a relatively straightforward term, and the substitution would be your horizontal velocity u, your vertical velocity w, divided by a, which is the radius of the Earth. This one will be simply what we had on the previous page of the delta p over rho, and we need to make sure that we properly account for a horizontal length scale here, which will be L. And then this will be the Coriolis term, and then we will have terms here for nu and what this will be in terms of its length scale, since it is a second derivative, is going to be 1 over L squared. In other words, 1 over the horizontal length scale squared, and of course then you'll have the U term in there. So that's the process, and if you were to sit and reason through this, making the substitutions and the like, then this is what you would get. That for these acceleration terms, you have U, which is coming from here, and then we have the U over L, which we derived earlier in a slide in this lecture. For this term here, you're going to have U, U. The trigonometric terms are going to be considered as having a value of about 1, and that's then going to be over A, so this is U squared over A. This is UW over A. This is delta P over rho, and then here's this L, which is representing the length scale of the horizontal gradient. Here is UF, which is the Coriolis term. Here's WF, which is this Coriolis term. And then the scale of the viscosity term is this viscosity coefficient times U, the velocity, over H squared. There's a little bit of a trick there because since this del squared is the second derivative with respect to x, the second derivative with respect to y, and the second derivative with respect to z, since h is smaller, that means that this is the dominant term of the viscosity. If we then take that and put the numbers into it, what we find is that this viscosity term is like 10 to the minus 12. 
This WF term is on the order of 10 to the minus 6. This curvature term, UU over A, is 10 to the minus 5. This curvature term of UW over A is 10 to the minus 8th. The acceleration term, U squared over L, is 10 to the minus 4. And the pressure gradient term and the Coriolis terms, scale is 10 to the minus 3. These two terms, the pressure gradient and the Coriolis terms, are for large scale motions. They have the tendency to be the largest terms. That is shown in this slide here where I have put the red square around the largest terms and then around the largest terms in the equation. If we just take those terms and recopy them here, considering here only the largest terms, then we have the two pressure gradient terms, the two Coriolis terms are approximately balanced, and this is the dominant balance between pressure gradient force and the Coriolis term, and this is the geostrophic balance. The geostrophic balance is one of a number of balances that we will see is important in defining really what we might call the background flow or the general nature of flow within the atmosphere. The hydrostatic balance, which was introduced earlier, is another one. So we will see this idea that there are balances that are reached because of the very nature of the Earth's rotation and the physical characteristics of the Earth that are important diagnostic terms to understand the dynamics. With that, the scale analysis of the horizontal momentum equations have been introduced.